If you've got your Bible with you, you turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 12 through 20 today. We're, if you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. And we walk through straight through books of the Bible. So we've been walking through the book of Galatians, going verse by verse. And this is the section that we're upon today. Um, and through the book of Galatians, all through this book, as we've walked through this letter that Paul sent to the church of Galatia, Paul has been fighting for the truth of the gospel. That salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. There were false teachers that had come into Galatia, and they were what we are calling Judaizers. They were teaching the Gentile Galatians that in order to be right with God, you must trust Jesus, but you also must keep the laws of Moses and live as Jews and do as the Jews have always done. And Paul has been in their face pretty much this whole letter, defending the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. In chapter 1, he said <clears throat> that if anyone preaches a different gospel, another gospel, let him be accursed, accursed of God. He's called the Galatians foolish twice in this letter because they're listening to this teaching. He's asked if the Galatians have been bewitched or put under a spell because they're falling for this. He says, who's bewitched you? He has been confrontational and he's been clear as he's defended his authority as an apostle and as he's defended the gospel that he preaches. Salvation is by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And he has been speaking urgently and kind of in your face because there are souls at stake here. The Galatians. God's name is at stake. His promise of salvation. His word. And in chapter 3 and 4, which is the section we're in right now, Paul has been showing us from the Old Testament, from the stories of Abraham and the texts about Abraham in Genesis and the promise to Abraham and the covenant to Abraham. He's been showing that, that in the scriptures, according to the things said to Abraham, salvation by faith alone in Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. He's also showed us the purpose of God's law, the Mosaic law. It was to drive us to the Savior, to show us our sin, to show us our wickedness and drive us to the only one who can save us, which is Christ. In the last text we looked at last week, he showed us our redemption, how Jesus has purchased us, bought us back, and then adopted us into the family of God as children of Abraham. And today in verses 12 through 20, what's going to happen here is Paul is going to change his tone just a bit. And we're really going to get a glimpse of his pastoral heart for the people of Galatia. He's going to pause the argument from Scripture and from Abraham and the covenant and all of those things. And he's going to pick that back up in verse 21. But here in this section, we see just this plea to the Galatians. We see his love and his care not just for doctrine and truth and theology and, and, and right understanding of God and His Word. All that's important, and Paul loves that for sure, as we all should. But we see also his love for these people, the Galatians. There's a reason that Paul is so bold and so uncompromising in standing for the gospel and refusing to bend. Yes, he seeks to please God more than people, for sure. Yes, he seeks to be faithful to his calling and to the commission that God has given him. But Paul loves these people. One preacher has said this way. He says, you don't love the gospel if you don't love people. He says, if you don't love people, then what you love is not the gospel. It's your own orthodoxy or your own pride or your own winning of the argument. To love the gospel of Jesus Christ is to love people and to call them to the salvation that this gospel brings. So with that, with that in mind, let's read verses 12 through 20. He says this, brothers, I entreat you become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, 
but for no good purpose, they want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would give us clarity today. Show us what you would have us to know, God, and that you would teach us, that you would change us. We thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So having read this text, what does Paul want from the Galatians? I mean, does he, does he just want to win the day for truth, for the sake of the gospel? I mean, well, yeah, he does. Does he want to silence those who are corrupting the Galatians, teaching them that they must obey these Jewish laws in order to be right with God? Does he want to silence them? Well, yeah, of course he does. But as you hear this heartfelt plea from the Apostle Paul, his purpose here is it's pastoral. It's discipleship oriented. He, he reminds them of their, their past relationship with one another. And he does so in order to persuade them to hold to what they first trusted in, to live according to the gospel, to live according to the gospel that Paul modeled for them. His purpose is that they would be in Christ and that Christ would be formed in them. That's what he says. So the first thing that Paul tells them in this section that we read is for them to just return to the freedom of the gospel. As we dive into verse 12, I want to back up and grab verses 9 through 11 because Paul is completing the thought here that he began in those verses that we dealt with last week. Paul is worried that he may have labored in vain because the Galatians are tempted to go back to keeping the law to be right with God. In verse 9 he says, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? We talked about that last week being legalism. Whose slaves you want to be once more. He said, you observe days and months and seasons and years. He's talking about the rituals and the legal things they had to do. He said, I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. And then he says, brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. Verse 12 in chapter 4 is the first command that Paul gives the Galatians in the letter to the Galatians. And the command is, become as I am. And he means by this, based on the context of chapter 3 and 4, one who is free from seeking his righteousness in the law. Paul says, become like me. I became like you. I was a Jew. I was, I was one who sought after the law to make me right with God. He says, but I laid all that aside. I counted all that is worthless for the sake of Christ. Look how Paul describes himself in Philippians chapter 3. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of, look at this, the surpassing or the greater worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul says these things when he says, be like me, become as I am. He's saying, find your righteousness in Christ like I have done. Not by going back to the law, not by keeping laws. If Paul were to say it like he said it in Galatians 2.20, he's telling them, be like me, be crucified with Christ and no longer live, but let Christ live in you. The life you now live, live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Paul is not saying, be like me because I am better than all your teachers. 
I am more godly than all these people that are around you. He's saying, be like me. I don't have any other righteousness than Jesus. And I don't want any other righteousness than Jesus. I put all my eggs into that one basket. All I have before God is Jesus Christ by faith. That's all I got. Over our study of Galatians, we've talked about a lot of ways that we as Christians, even today, add other things to the gospel. How we seek to find our peace and our purpose, our joy, our righteousness, our right standing before God by chasing after other things or chasing after accomplishments. If I could just do better, God would finally be pleased with me and I'd be in right relationship with him. If I could just be better, I could finally have the joy of my salvation. If I could just make this bad situation that I'm in better, oh, I'd finally be satisfied. I'd finally have this peace that passes understanding. Listen, as a pastor, that's painful to see someone walking away from our sufficiency in the gospel. It's painful to see someone seeking their satisfaction, their rest, their peace in their situation or their works or works of the law or things, anything that cannot satisfy the soul. Listen, as believers, you guys, it breaks your own heart when you see it happening to someone you love. When you see them heading the wrong way, you want to shout to them and say, hey, stop, turn around. You're going the wrong way. You're not going to find what you're seeking that way or in that thing or in that effort. Go to Christ. Run to him through the gospel. Find all your rest there. Find perfect peace in his salvation. Don't put your your hope in anything else. It's a lie. It's going to enslave you. That's what Paul is saying to the Galatians. Be like me doesn't mean model your life after my goodness and my greatness and my practice. He's saying be like me and throw away all of that stuff as your means of being right before God and trust in Christ alone. He's saying do what I've done. Find your righteousness in Jesus alone. Go back to the gospel. Go back to the joy of your salvation. And as Paul continues to build on this message, specifically with the Galatians, he calls them to remember how they received the message of the gospel and how they received Paul as the messenger that brought them the gospel. In this verse, at the end of verse 12, he says, You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, You did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. He says it was because of a bodily ailment, literally a weakness of the flesh, that I first came and preached the gospel to you in the region of Galatia. Now we're not told what this sickness was, what this bodily ailment was, and there have been a lot of suggestions down through the centuries Some people think it's malaria, some people think it's epilepsy, some people think it's a a disease of the eye or something wrong with his eyes. Some say that it's just his injuries that he sustained from being stoned outside of Lystra and persecuted in Galatia. We're not told what the ailment is. I can tell you what I think, but it's just a guess. But whatever it was, it must have been bad because he describes it as a trial for the Galatians. Do you see it in verse 14? Though my condition was a trial to you, they had evidently been tempted to despise him, to scorn him, to to treat him with loathing, to recoil away from him because of this ailment that he had. But Paul reminds them, that's not what you did. He says, you didn't do me any wrong. He said, you received me. You received me as an angel, a messenger of God. You received me as Christ Jesus, meaning they received and welcomed him as one who was sent from the Lord, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Even though Paul was in a pitiful state, the Galatians received his message, received him as a messenger of the Lord. Paul reminds them of this because his presence among them when he first preached the gospel among them It wasn't attractive, and it wasn't particularly persuasive with this ailment that he had. He was sickly, he was ailing, and he's reminding them that, look, most people would have been disgusted and turned away by this ailment, 
and certainly not receive me or the message, but you did. Why did they receive him? Because God moved through the gospel that Paul was preaching to them. The Spirit had come upon the Galatians as they received the gospel and they were saved. In chapter 3, we're told that they received the Spirit by hearing with faith. And because of God's work through the gospel, they received Paul as well. And then Paul asks them two pointed questions in 15 and 16. He says, what then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Blessedness is, it, it could also be translated in, as joyfulness or happiness. Some of your translations may reflect that. It's the same word that Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount to say, blessed are the poor in spirit or happy are you when people persecute you. When the Galatians received salvation by faith in Jesus, as Paul brought the gospel to them, they experienced the fruit of the Spirit, joyfulness, peace. They experienced the blessedness of the salvation Jesus gives in the gospel. And that joy and that blessedness, it overflowed out of them to Paul. He says, what happened to your blessedness? I testified that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and gave them to me. They were overcome with their salvation so much so that Paul said, it poured out all over me that you were accepting me and received me and you would have done anything for me. Paul's saying, do you remember that? You remember the joy you felt when salvation came to you outside the law, outside of any work you could do, outside of anything? Do you remember, you remember how you experienced the forgiveness of your sin? And in that moment when the gospel transformed your heart you were righteous before God for no other reason than Jesus died for me and the Holy Spirit transformed you Paul saying do you remember how you and I were united together in that fellowship it didn't matter who was a Jew and who was a Gentile you loved me and I loved you Paul would say we were one in Christ and Paul says in verse 16 now look at you Am I your enemy now for telling you the truth? What changed? Paul might say, I'm preaching the same message now as I was then. The very message that, that created this bond between Paul and the Galatians was now the message that was causing a rift between them. The message didn't change. They changed. Believer, do you remember when you received the gospel? When you were born again? You remember the, the blessedness of, that you experienced from God being forgiven? Do you remember the blessedness you experienced being united to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Look, when Jesus saved you, if you're born again, if you're a believer today, Saved today. When Jesus saved you, you had done nothing at all as far as works of the law. In fact, you understood in that moment that you had no goodness of your own. You had no righteousness of your own. You had done absolutely nothing of merit before God. There was nothing on your account but sin and wickedness. And it was from that place that Jesus saved you and made you righteous, paid the full price for your sin. Do you remember that joy and that peace when the weight of guilt and sin and condemnation was just lifted off your shoulders and you no longer bore it for it was taken upon the cross. You remember that blessedness of, of knowing that you are accepted by God for no other reason than Jesus Christ and him crucified. What's changed? Where did that joy go? Why has the zeal for the gospel and the reality of that magnificent truth cooled over the years? Why has other things crept in to take our focus and our attention away from this incredible and unfathomable gospel? 
The gospel's still the same. It's still true. Jesus alone, by faith, nothing else. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. The gospel has not changed. We've changed. The gospel just doesn't seem so magnificent anymore. Because all of us, all of us, we just get used to being forgiven. We get used to being free. We get distracted by the shiny things. We get deceived into thinking now, well, now I need something else in order to be really fulfilled or really satisfied in God. I need something else to just have this deeper walk with Him, deeper relationship with Him. In order to be right with God, I need, I need something else now. I've got the gospel. We did that. You know, I did that back when I was nine. Now I need the deep stuff. Foolishness. Maybe it's works we think we need to add, or programs, or new teachings, or this, this new thing that's coming out that nobody's ever heard of in 2,000 years, but finally somebody's figured it out and they wrote a book about it. We start thinking we need something else just to finally reach a higher level with God. Something that's finally going to give me the key that I've been missing all this time for this greater, deeper, more profound experience with God. Maybe if I can just get out of this trial of life that I'm going through or fix this situation, then I can have peace and fulfillment. There's nothing wrong with grieving a bad situation. There's nothing wrong with grieving. There's not, nothing wrong with wanting to fix a situation or, 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 or finding joy in things of the world like, like sports or, or, or of the beach or something. It, you can find joy in all of those things. But when those things become the source of my joy, when they're taken away, all of a sudden I don't have any joy, then something's wrong. Our joy, our peace, our fulfillment is found in Christ. And we can grieve and be in sorrow and suffering. And at the same time, we won't be happy, but we'll still have an abiding joy in Christ. Listen, when that happens, when we start thinking, oh, I got to have this other thing to be right with God or to be, uh, have a higher standing with God or to, or to experience the joy of God or uh, I got to have this other thing besides the gospel, whatever it is, Listen, when, when we fall into that thinking, you get dropped into a hole of despair and hopelessness and self-focused religion because you've left the only place that a joy-filled, righteous relationship with God is found, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now you're seeking to work your way to find the peace that you experienced before, the rest for your soul that can only be found in Christ. Paul's saying to them, don't add the law. Remember the joy of your salvation. Remember the blessedness of being in Christ. Go back to the cross where it's the only place that you will find rest for your soul. Let's go back to the cross together. And finally, he says, he basically tells them to recognize the motives of those seeking you. I'm going to camp out here just for a little bit. Listen, there are always many voices calling to us all the time. Some from outside, some from inside. And they tell us what we need to do, what we need to have, what we need to accomplish in order to be happy, in order to be joyful, in order to be righteous, in order to have peace, in order to be right with God. There's always someone or something Seeking to win you over. What Paul does in this last section, 17 through 20, is he contrasts the motives of those that are seeking to win the Galatians, these false teachers, and his own motive for seeking to persuade them to go back to the gospel. So we need to recognize the motives of the voices that are trying to seek us, to win us over. In verse 17, he says, They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, that you may make much of them. It is always good to be make, made much of for a good purpose and not only when I am present with you. I don't know why, but the ESV just confuses. I read it and I'm thinking, what did he just say? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the NASB up there just for you. 
It says they eagerly seek you. When the ESV says they make much of you, that word comes from the word where we get our word zealous from. Paul is saying these false teachers are seeking after you. They're making much of you, meaning they're seeking to win you over. They're seeking to win over the Galatians. But they're doing it for their own selfish pride. Paul says they want to exclude you. They want to shut you out. And here's the reason. So that you will seek after them. They want to shut you out from the gospel, from Paul himself, and from the people of God. And they're doing so so the Galatians would seek them These teachers wanted the Galatians to be their disciples, to be dependent upon them for their teaching and for their instruction. If they were to win the Galatians over to thinking you could add law or you needed to add laws to the gospel, listen, the Galatians would be enslaved to them. The Galatians would be dependent upon these Judaizers to instruct them instruct them in all the different laws that you had to keep, all the things you had to do in order to please God and to find rest in His salvation. These teachers wanted to be the gatekeepers between the Galatians and God. They sought to win the Galatians for their own pride. Now Paul is clear in verse 18 that seeking to win someone over, making much of someone in the the ESV, is not a bad thing if it's done for a good purpose. He said it is good always to be eagerly sought or to be made much of in a commendable manner for a good purpose and not only when I am with you. Paul says it's always good to be sought after for a good purpose, not just when I'm there, if these, if, look, if Paul might say, if, if other teachers came into Galatia and, and they were teaching the truth of the gospel and they were seeking to persuade you Galatians to follow Christ more closely or to walk with Christ and the gospel, Paul wouldn't have a problem with that. That's always a good thing. Whether I'm there or not, Paul says, it's good to be sought commendably. You don't need me there to have truth or to be faithful to Christ. If folks were seeking you for a good purpose or commendably, I wouldn't say a word about it. Paul's not trying to win converts to himself or disciples to himself. He isn't trying to bolster his esteem or his notoriety, and he isn't seeking them for his own personal glory. He wants them to be conformed to Christ. Verse 19 and 20, our last two verses, shows us Why Paul is seeking them, the good purpose for which he is seeking to win them. He says, my children, this is back in the ESV, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Look, Paul is seeking them too. In seeking to persuade them, to win them over, to defend the truth of the gospel to them, Paul is laboring over them, just like he did when he first came and preached the gospel to them in Galatia. He, see, he feels like he has to do it all over again, seeking to win them all over again. And he describes this as an effort, as, as a mother in labor pains for them. He's laboring, he's suffering through this striving and straining to persuade them all over again. But notice the motive that he does, that the reason why he does this. It isn't to win them for his glory. It's so Christ would be formed in you. That's his goal. He wants them to grow to maturity in Christ, in the gospel. That Christ would live in them by faith. That's pastoral ministry right there. That is every God-called pastor's goal, to see Christ formed in the people. But that's also discipleship as well. That's every Christian's, every Christian's duty to make disciples. Jesus gave it as the great commission. And that's the goal of discipleship, to see Christ formed in you. Our purpose is to see people conform to Jesus, to see hearts conform to Jesus, to see their affections centered on Jesus. We want people to love what Jesus loves and hate what Jesus hates. 
We want people to yearn after the things that Christ is yearning for and to find your rest in Him. We want people to live for Him, to honor Him, to glorify Him. And we want people to do it even when life seems unfair. Even when we don't get what we want. Even when God's plan is different from my plan. Being formed, Christ formed in us, means He is the source of my joy. He is the source of my peace. He is the source of my right standing with God, my salvation, my everything. So even when this life isn't going the way that I think it should go, it's okay to grieve that, but my joy is not found in fixing this. My joy is found in Christ. But I want you to notice, Paul loves them. And when things don't go my way, and somebody comes along and says, well, that's not where your joy is anyway. That's a hard truth to hear sometimes. That's when we don't want to hear it. But Paul loves them. Verse 20, he says, I wish I could be there and change my tone. Up to this point in Galatians, he has been forceful, confrontational, you foolish Galatians. What's wrong with you? He said some hard things. But he's done so because he loves them. He doesn't want them to turn back to slavery and destroy their lives by seeking after works of the law when Christ has fulfilled those things. He doesn't want them to forsake the truth of the gospel. Now, he's not talking about just sin all you want and walking in unholiness. We're going to get there in, verse, in chapter 5 and 6. He's going to tell them to walk in the Spirit. But that is not where your righteousness with God is found. He doesn't want them to forsake their joy in Christ. He loves them with a deep and abiding love, so much so that he says, I'm at my wit's end. I am perplexed about you. That is the heart. That's a pastoral heart. Paul is, has a heart for these people, but that's also the heart of disciple makers. That's the heart of all those who are united together in Jesus Christ's name, those who love one another for Christ's sake. As I mentioned in the beginning, if you don't love people, you don't love the gospel. Our mission is people. Seeking that people would come to Christ, would grow as disciples of Christ, that Christ would be formed in people. Not for our own numbers, not for our own pride, not for our own glory. Paul loves these people as a mother who is laboring for her child. But I also want you to notice this. His love for them, his deep love for them. It didn't just show up here in chapter 4. He's loved them the whole time he's written this letter. So his love for him, them, it doesn't cause Paul to change his message. It doesn't cause Paul to give ground when it comes to God's truth. Because he loves them, he can't just tell them what they want to hear. He can't say, well, it's okay, you, you, you got your way and I got my way and we, we just do things differently. No, no, they're forsaking the gospel here. He must tell them the truth of God because that's the only place of freedom, of salvation, of peace and joy, of being right with God. Peace and joy and long-suffering and all those things, that's fruits of the Holy Spirit growing in you as you grow in Christ. That's what it looks like to have Christ formed in you. Do you want to grow in Christ? To be continually conformed to His image? The way you do that, church, is not through programs or principles or more works of the law or more law keeping or doing better or being better or fixing this situation or finally achieving this or finally getting that or finally getting rid of this trial. It's not hoping that we can get out of whatever tribulation we're in in this life. You will always have tribulation. The way that Christ is formed in us is by walking more and more in step with the gospel of Jesus Christ as we cling to His salvation and to His righteousness, not our own. 
Let's go back to the cross together. Let's go back there daily. We all need to because we are easily distracted. We are easily deceived, even by our own hearts. Let's go back to the cross every hour and never get past it. Never go beyond it. Never be distracted from the reality that in Christ, I have all things. And before God, there is no sin on my account because I am in Christ. And as I follow him, and I do follow him because my heart has been changed. If you're a believer in Christ, your heart has been changed and you desire to follow Christ. You desire to keep his law. You desire to obey his commandments. But that's not where my joy comes from. That's not where my salvation comes from. That's not where my right standing before God comes from. It comes from Jesus Christ alone. In 40 years, I'll be 90 years old. Who? I'm going to stop making statements like that to you people. I know who did that too. I'm going to get you. When I'm 90, 40 years from now, I can almost, knowing my heart the way I do, I can almost guarantee you when I wake up on my 90th birthday, I'm going to say something, do something, think something that's sinful, that's wrong. I'm going to fail to do something that I'm supposed to do. I'm going to fail to keep the law of God perfectly. I can guarantee it. And on that day, 40 years from now, I can know with certain assurance that Jesus paid for that sin too. And it has nothing to do with how great I'm doing, how wonderful I am. There's evidence that if you've been saved, there's evidence in your heart, evidence in your life. You're walking after Christ. You're walking after the law of God. But that's not where your standing before God comes. And so it cannot be where your peace and your joy and your rest and your satisfaction and your fulfillment come from. It has to come from God because you were designed that way. You can't get it from anywhere else. And the only way to breach that that wall between you and God is not your works or your goodness or how much laws you keep or how many principles you know or how much Bible you memorize or how much theology you know or how great life is and all my trials are behind me. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He alone is where that is found. Let's go back to the cross together. Let's go back there daily, every hour, moment by moment, and never get past it. Never, we wouldn't think this, but never live or or feel according to the worldly standard that says, God, what have you done for me lately? He's done everything. Paul says to the Galatians, be like me. And what he means that, what he means by that is count everything as loss for the greater worth, the more superior worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord to be found without my own righteousness, but with his righteousness on my account. Have you trusted in Christ alone? If you've trusted in Jesus You are seated in heavenly places with Christ. You have all things in Christ. All spiritual blessings are yours in Christ. In Christ, the promises of God are yes and amen. Do I need to quote any more Bible verses to you? You have it all in Christ. Don't get past the cross. Don't get past the gospel. Yes, we're going to grow. Yes, we'll grow in our knowledge, in our understanding. We'll even grow closer in our understanding of God and our walking with God. But we will never move not one inch from the perfection before God that Jesus has given us in the gospel. And we can rejoice in that. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for, God, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that our hearts have been changed if we're born again so that we do seek after you. We do seek to obey your law. We do seek to walk in your commandments. But praise God, that's not the standing by which we stand before you because if it were, none of us, none of us would be right. We thank you for Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Jesus, we thank you for taking upon flesh, coming, living the perfect life we couldn't live, dying on a cross in our place, rising from the grave and sitting down at the right hand of the Father, completing the work that must be done for us to be us sinners to be right with God. Father, I pray that you would just emblazon that upon our hearts every moment of every day and let us find let us find that peace for that's the only place where it's found. God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray that you would just draw their heart to you, that they would trust in you, that they would give you their heart and life, trusting that Jesus died for my sin, that he paid my price, and that I am redeemed through him, trusting that he took my place, he rose from the grave, and his life is my life, and my sin is completely paid for. God, I pray that they would call out to you. I pray that they would call out to you for salvation. And as believers, God, I pray that you would help us just to walk in the gospel. It is the refrain of Scripture over and over and over and over again. Let it be the refrain of our hearts and lives as well. We do love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys will stand with me. If you want to come down front, I'll be down here. I would love to pray with you, love to share more about the gospel, give your heart and life to Christ. It's the most important thing you could do today.